my goodness, what a bright, energetic crowd. Wow. Good morning. Good morning. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. All right. A good shout before a little sit is probably a good idea. Um, good morning to all of you. I'm so glad you're here. By the way, do you know where here is? Where are you? All right. All right. Say a little bit louder. All right, welcome to the Library of Congress. Uh, my name is Maria Rana, I'm the literary director here, and it's such a pleasure to be here working on this wonderful program in collaboration with the Children's Book Council and Every Child a Reader, who are our partners in this, and we're very proud to, to be a part of this fabulous program that's been running now for many, many years. Uh, I think it's 10 or 11 years by now, and it's my pleasure to introduce someone who not only manages this extraordinary institution, but also has a special appreciation for all of you, for young people in general, and has a deep understanding of how young people think and what they like. So please join me in welcoming the 14th Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden. Okay. Well. Good morning. I have to tell you, and you've already seen me go up and down the steps, because I am very excited. On the way in on the train this morning from Baltimore, I started thinking about this program. And I said, we are going to have two of the coolest authors <laughs> in the world. I even, and when I got to work, I had to change my outfit because I said I at least have to step it up a little bit. <laughs> but that's really what's so exciting. So I want to thank Marie and just to tell you that it is just a remarkable time and it's wonderful to see this beautiful auditorium filled with so many beautiful young people. So thank you for being here because you represent our future. Now, I wouldn't be doing my job as a librarian in the Librarian of Congress if I didn't tell you that books and reading saved my life. They were my salvation. They helped me through good times and bad times. They made me feel that being a nerd wasn't so bad. And they just helped whenever I needed some help. And so that is why the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature Program was created. The ambassador travels all over the country spreading the word about reading and why it can help you in so many ways and just give you so much pleasure as well. And I can tell you, True confession, I would not be standing here today without books and reading. I often talk about an experience I had, and this is going to tell you how long, a book that was written in 1946. Now, I wasn't born then. <laughs> is there some skepticism here? <laughs> However, I, had, I loved books and reading, and I've told you they, they meant so much to me. But until some, I, uh, there was a librarian, I can't remember her. But when I came in, I was seven years old, Jamaica, Queens, and I went into that storefront branch, and she put this book in my hand. It was called Bright April, and it was about a little girl who was brown like me, and who had pigtails, and who was doing all these things. And it was the first time I saw myself in a book. And even though I read a lot and looked at it, I'd never seen me. So when we think about our authors today, think about books being windows on the world, but also mirrors as well. Now we have a lot of people who, and I think Marie, Miss Marie asked you, uh, how many of you have been to the Library of Congress before? Could you raise your hands if you have? Okay, well, we're gonna change that. Uh, well, we have a lot of programs for young people and the National Book Festival is held every year and we're having our 20th anniversary 
and one of our rock stars today will be there signing himself. We also have schools here, and I've asked you to do this, so let's see if you can outshout each other. And as the librarian, you have permission to be loud in the library. <laughs> okay. Now, Jason Reynolds attended Bishop McNamara High School. <laughs> I think Mr. Jefferson heard that. <laughs> this is the Thomas Jefferson building. Okay, how about State St. Stephen's and St. Agnes High School? <laughs> Kip DC AIM Academy? <laughs> Washington, Washington International High School? <laughs> Stuart Hobson Middle School? <laughs> DC International High School? Ida B. Wells Middle School, yeah. Alice Deal Middle School, we're on a middle school roll, St. Patrick's Middle School, come on middle schools, you're going to be in high school soon, Roosevelt High School, yeah. see middle school, you're going to do that, Richard White Wright High School for Media and Journalism, yeah. Dunbar High School, Eastern High School, Balloon High School. Thank you, thank you. Because you should know that that's what it's about. So I am going to turn the program back over to Maria Rana, our literary director, and we're going to keep making noise. Oh man, you guys had a little exercise. <laughs> Lung power is great, I love it. Um, our next speaker comes from an organization that created the National Ambassador Program with the Library of Congress. Children's Book Council Executive Director Carl Lennertz manages the association that has partnered with us since 2008. He's also Executive Director of Every Child a Reader. Carl is a longtime, very distinguished publishing executive and book advocate who joined the CBC in 2016. Will you please welcome, with your very big lung power, Carl Lennertz. <laughs> I've got to follow that. Oh my god. Um, I come bearing gratitude and gifts. One gift right away here Friday April. It's Friday April. See, she was much prettier. But I, I thought, wow, look at her. Thank you You're so welcome. much. I have more gifts, including being on time. I'll be in, you didn't come here to hear me talk, so I'm going to go pretty quickly. Gratitude and gifts, I'm so grateful to the library, Marie, Anya, the staff. You guys are wonderful to work with. I am so grateful for Jacqueline and Jason. I have a few more things to say in a minute. Uh, for all of you here, thank you. All of you watching at home by live stream and from your offices, we have a lot of people 10 times, 100 times watching from elsewhere in live stream. Um, this is like one big field trip today, right? A um, little break from school and work. Except for the library, they're, they're working like crazy today. Uh, we got people who came from Milwaukee's in the house, Florida, right. New Jersey, East Orange, Brooklyn, New York, New England, Connecticut. Anybody else from further away? All right, pretty good travel plans. Um, I am so grateful for the Ambassador Selection Committee who is here today. DC independent booksellers, and for that matter, independent booksellers everywhere, you are essential. I get choked up by independent booksellers, I'm sorry. I'm also grateful for librarians and teachers everywhere, here and watching at home. Um, I was a small town kid who hung out in the library in town and in the school library, and like you, it saved me. 
Um, I'm grateful for First Book, Just Us Books, Quelly, We Need Diverse Books, Open Book, Brown Bookshelf, and other organizations here and working every day to spread the joy of reading. Thank you all. Our first ambassador, John Chesko, was supposed to be here, but rookie move, he took a plane today. Like, who flies the day of an event like this? His, his plane was canceled. I had a joke all set saying, John, your first medal is made of bubblegum, man. It's not that great. The new medal, medals are beautiful now. Um, I'm grateful for my colleagues at Children's Book Council and every child reader. Uh, Shane at home with Theodore. Louder, I get emotional. Um, Ryan and Jenna working at the office, get back to work. Uh, <laughs> Both the boards of directors for the CBC and Every Child Reader are here and supporting our work every day. I'm grateful for every children's book publisher in America, 100 plus, who have donated their money and time to the Ambassador Program for over 12 years now. We wouldn't be here without you. Yeah, thank you. I'm winding up. And of course, I'm very grateful for Simon Schuster, Jason's publisher, who have mobilized everybody to come together on this. You know, as the Jacqueline publisher Penguin, Macmillan for Gene Yang, everybody pulls together on this, and it's, um, we are here to do the good work that you are doing. Okay, gifts. Everyone loves getting a book. Even adults love getting books. <laughs> we have lots of books at home, getting a book, you know, that's from, that you inspired you, whatever, so I write April for you. Um, and I also have a time signed Toni Morrison, Beloved, for my library. Whoa. Uh, Marie, who I've just met, um, I googled famous Peruvian novelists, and they're almost all men, so what's up with that? So I found a classic from 1904 about a Peruvian journalist and human rights advocate, and I have a copy of that for her today, as well as the 100 Years of Children's Week posters, 100 Years of Artwork, all right, and announcement, uh, Date Kate DiCamello, the fourth ambassador, just did a poster for us. She's caught reading a book, and we have posters for all the classrooms in America. Uh, thank you, Kate. We're also doing one for Catherine Patterson, who is the second ambassador. So, uh, John Cheska, Kate DiCamilla, um, Catherine Patterson, Jackie's here, Jason's here. There, there are two more ambassadors I haven't mentioned yet, but Jacqueline, for you I have the book inspired you, the 50th anniversary edition of The Outsiders, which I inspired Miracle Boys, and another copy of Toni Morrison. Fine. So, you're welcome. Um, Thank you for your work and travel away from family, away from your writing. You taught us a lot about what we could do better, so we'll do that. All right, we're coming down to it. Here it is, Jason. I got your books by the other two ambassadors, Walter Dean Myers, um, Young Landlords, a library binding, good for the shelf, wow. and Gene Yang's Shadow Hero. Okay. We love comics, we love Gene. Do you have a comic book collection here? Yes, the largest in the world. Wow. Just saying. <laughs> So I have books of thank you because they're tangible, they're real, and, but the intangibles are um, back to gratitude and gifts. Jason, thank you. We're grateful for you and your gift of love and compassion. Thank you. That's it. I'm done. Carl. Let's give a shout to Carl. Carl, thank you so much. Such thoughtful and meaningful gifts, you took time. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I wanna start with my introduction uh, to the person who has been the National Ambassador for Youth, Young People's Literature for the past two years with another piece of gratitude to my young adult librarian, Ms. Deborah Taylor. You may not know, but Deborah Taylor was the librarian who said, you know, there's a young lady, Jacqueline Woodson. She writes and it's magic, she said. It's magic. And then Jason, whoa! And it just, she just uh, was the person who introduced me to such uh, just a new world. And Jacqueline Woodson, has won more honors than I can mention. And I'm just gonna give you a few. Four-time 
Newbery Honor Medalist, a Coretta Scott King Book Award winner, a National Book Award winner for her memoir and verse, Brown Girl Dreaming. And during her two years as ambassador, Jacqueline Woodson traveled nationwide discussing her theme, reading equals hope times change. What's your equation? And she encouraged young people to think about, and all of us to think about, what about beyond the moment and the moment we're living in and the power we possess and the ways that reading can demonstrate how to create the change we want to see in the world. So Jackie, I know young people across the country have been inspired by your work and your words, as well as your personal interactions with so many all over this country. And we just wanna thank you so much for being the best ambassador that we could have. And when I bring her up, she put her life on hold for young readers and your example for future ambassadors, but also for being like the coolest. <laughs> so Jacqueline Woodson, come on up. just asked if this was a bittersweet moment to be passing on the torch to the most fabulous Jason Reynolds and until y'all stood up for me it wasn't <laughs> it was a very happy moment it still is a very happy moment um, I want to thank the Library of Congress and Dr. Carla Hayden um, for helping me on this journey the Children's Book Council that went above and beyond, um, Carl and Shana, who is not here because she's home with her new baby, right? Um, and everyone at the Children's Book Council let me whine and complain and um, ask for help and ask for books. And, and my publisher and my editor, Nancy Paulson, who um, really supported me. This position takes so much support. <laughs> Um, as ambassador, one thing we want to do is basically spread the gospel of reading uh, and how important it is to our lives and the many ways we can take in content, the content of literature, that it's, uh, reading books is fabulous. My son reads differently, so my son always has an audio book in his ear, and it's most of the time Jason Reynolds. And, um, when it's not Jason Reynolds, it's Kwame Alexander. So, um, but, but he's constantly talking about literature and the books he's reading. And as ambassador, I've been traveling the country from Alabama to Alaska to Africa, outside of the country, talking to young people and um, having them talk to me and really gathering and finding out about their lives and the books they're reading and what their hopes are uh, for this country, for their futures, and for the futures of their children and their children's children. And it has been magical. And what you see here is the ending of something, me ending as ambassador. What you don't see is the beginning. Um, when I was a seven-year-old, when I was a 10-year-old struggling with my own reading, when I wrote my first book and people were like, you wrote a book? Um, when someone published my book and people were like, someone published your book? And um, when I did one of my first readings, which was at Enoch Pratt Library, where Debbie Taylor invited someone who very few people knew her name. And then many years later, Enoch Pratt chose Miracles Boys as uh, an All City Reads. And it was, um, again, through the support of people who saw me, who helped me move get on this journey to finally be ambassador. And um, in Africa, I met with a group of Ijab girls who were telling their own stories in a program where they met on Saturdays and were able to read, to write, to rap, and to talk about their futures in a very 
oppressive situation. Um, in Alabama, I went to a juvenile home for boys um, that was predominantly white and had an amazing library. And as I was telling Jason earlier, as I was leaving, all the guys who we had engaged, we had had a fabulous time, um, started giving me this upside down OK symbol. And I was like, OK, they really like me. They're giving me the OK symbol. And later on, I found that that's not what it was, that they were actually giving me another kind of symbol. Um, and I thought to myself, well, OK, this is what you have right now. And I still see you. And I think the role of the ambassador is to go around the country and see people and let you know how much y'all matter to us. We love y'all so much, young people. You are going to save us. And I'm sorry you have to save us. I know the truth was <laughs> that adults were supposed to save you, but we jacked it up. Y'all know we jacked it up. <laughs> and this is where you come in. And speaking for all adults, I'm sorry we jacked it up. <laughs> And I'm so glad that you're here and you're changing the world and you're so badass. I know I'm not supposed to say badass in the Library of Congress, but y'all are so badass. Um, and I love you so much. So um, in Alaska, I met with a whole bunch of indigenous young people who were reading everything from Kate DeCamillo to Walter Dean Myers to Mo Willems to Jason Reynolds. Um, and to Rita Williams Garcia. And I love the fact that our books were there. And our books were there not always because the young people could afford to buy them, but because publishers had donated those books, because the CBC had made sure books got into the kids' hands, because of First Book, because of We Need Diverse Books. So this is all to say that we can get the books to you. We can get the books in your hand. And the people who are interested in getting an ambassador into their space, um, that can happen. So because we want it to happen. And we want to find all kinds of ways to make it happen. We're not here to make a lot of money. As an ambassador, you do not make a lot of money. <laughs> Uh, you do this work because you love the work, and you do this work because you feel like there's a way you can create change. So ambassadors, more than ambassadors, we're activists. We're trying to create change. We're trying to have the conversations that are going to move this country and this world forward somehow. And it's been a great, great reign. Um, the other day I came home, I had done my last thing in Brooklyn at a Title I school. And I had put my bag on the front bench, and my metal was sticking out of it. And I, I left my bag there. I, I know I should have put it away because I have a huge poodle German Shepherd mix that likes to chew things. I came back, and the ribbon of my metal had been completely chewed off. And that was the sign from the family that, Jackie, you need to stay your behind home now <laughs> and pass this torch on. And so it is with great delight that I take this medal off and pass it on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Jackie. And also, we are just breaking all kinds of rules in the library today. We're saying things, we're doing things, we're yelling. I'm loving it. And you should know, too, that Jacqueline Woodson will be uh, still active in the next year and so at the Kennedy Center in the New Reach. She's going to be an ambassador there, so she will be in the area, and you will still see a lot of her. So thank you. So what can I say about Jason Reynolds that hasn't already been said? He is a rock star. Yeah, he is. He, he is. He is. He is. And for someone, he's someone who has people lined up, and this is what rock stars have, for hours just to meet him. And his connection with young people is immediate and intense. And I know that you will feel the same way when he uh, steps onto this stage. He was born right here in Washington, D.C., and grew up. 
and grew up in Oxon Hill, Maryland. Rap, <laughs> rap music inspired him, and so he began to write poetry when he was just nine. And he focused on poetry, and he said, and I'm gonna ask him about this, he never fully read a novel from cover to cover until he was 19. 17, oh, he's trying to get a few more years in there. Okay, okay, 17. He wrote his own first novel, When I Was the Greatest, in 2014, and he has won the Coretta Scott King, John Steptoe Award for New Talent with this first novel, and seven more novels followed in the next four years, including Ghost, and two more books in his New York Times bestselling track series. As Brave As You, published in 2016, won the Kirkus Prize, the NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literary Work, on and on, more and more awards. And his latest book, a National Book Award finalist, is Look Both Ways, A Tale Told in Ten Blocks, from Anthenaeum, an imprint of Simon & Schuster. And with us from Simon & Schuster are Lauren Hoffman, Vice President and Director of Marketing and Publicity. Lauren? Yay. Lisa Moraleda. Director of Publicity. And I just want to take a moment to thank the entire Simon & Schuster publishing team, including their president and publisher, John Anderson. They have made it possible for all of you in the audience to have a signed copy of Jason's new book. And gratitude is also due to Dollar General Literacy Foundation for supporting this event. And also, during his term as national ambassador, Jason will visit small towns across America. Through his program, Grab the Mic, Tell Your Story, he will discuss his journey from a reluctant reader to award-winning author, all the while empowering young people to share their own personal stories. And speaking of stories, I have a very special clip for you that's gonna be shown. It features Jason Reynolds and his mother in a StoryCorps interview. The interviews of StoryCorps are stored here at the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. And Jason, though, is not new to StoryCorps because in this brief clip, he talks about not only what he did in StoryCorps, but also the influence of his mother, Isabel Reynolds. Play the clip. My mom, she's definitely my uh, angel. Yeah. I have fond memories of being a child, and the first thing she told me to say was, I can do anything. I had to say it every night before I go to bed. You know, whether I said, you know, the Lord's Prayer and all of that wasn't of its importance. You know, she'd much rather me just say, you know, I can do anything. Um, she drilled that into my head really early in life. So when I was going through my, my confusing years of high school and I was ripping and running and I was cutting up and acting a fool, I think she always knew he'll come back. And so looking back on it, it's like, wow, I may have been one of the luckiest guys to have a mother who was so open-minded. She never told me to hold in my words. or She never, if I had a problem with something, she'd express it, you know, never, never, never mute yourself. After um, StoryCorps, do you have an idea of where you want to go next? I, I, uh, I want to be a writer. And that's my ultimate goal, man. I want to shock the world. Um, that's my ultimate goal. But in order for that to happen, I got to live. And through StoryCorps, this is a way of, you know, seeing the life. Constant inspiration. I really believe that every person walking this earth has a story. Everybody has a story that could change the outlook of life for somebody else. And so, we asked you to make noise before, but I really want you to make noise for Jason's mother, who's with us today, Miss Isabel Reynolds. Please stand up. <laughs> Miss Reynolds, stand up. Come on, stand up, Miss Reynolds. Come on.
Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Now, before we hear from Jason, his friend and colleague, Jackie Woodson, would like to say a few words. So come on back up. When we were trying to decide on who this torch would get passed to, I couldn't think of anyone else. I've known Jason for many years now, and one thing I know is he has a deep integrity and passion, and he talks to young people in a way that y'all can hear him, and, and he listens to you in a way that makes me extremely proud, and I've learned so much from him, and um, everything from his presence in the room to his voice to the books that he's written to what he has to say to the fact that he wants to go into rural communities and go where the young people are means so much to me, and I am so deeply proud um, about this moment, and I absolutely love Jason Reynolds, so take the mic. <laughs> The moment we've been waiting for, please welcome the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature, Mr. Jason Reynolds. How y'all doing? Everybody good? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to say, this will be just a moment. I want to say a few things. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank um, the Library of Congress and Dr. Hayden and the CBC and every child a reader, Simon and Schuster, of course, my mama uh, and my family who's here, and of course, all of you. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to, uh, to receive such an incredible um, responsibility. And that's what it is. This isn't an award. I know people are like, oh, it's an award. you got an award, man. Congratulations on your, on your award. It's like, it's not an award. Uh, it's, it's a role. It's a responsibility. Uh, and I'm going to do my very best to make sure that I uphold it um, and, and, and make something of it. Uh, really quickly, I want to share two very quick stories. I was, years ago, I think I was in like West Palm Beach or in some sort of uh, a marginalized small town. We were in an auditorium in a school. I think it was middle school, we were in an auditorium, and I always open it up after my talk, I do a Q&A like everybody does, right? Uh, but for my Q&A, I always say that the young people can ask whatever they want. Of course, the teachers get a little uncomfortable immediately, right? Uh, but I, I'm always kind of like, no, 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 they, there's, there's no inappropriate questions, there's no stupid, quote unquote, stupid questions. Let the young folks ask anything they want to ask, and I'll navigate it. Every single time I've done this, which is, you know, three times a week, right? There's some young person who's like, yo, can you rap, right? And in this particular case, it was a, a young girl. She's like, yo, can you rap for us? And my response is always the same. It's always, yo, can you rap for me, right? Now, usually what happens is you either get a kid who is like, yeah, and then I'm like, cool, come up here and you can make it happen, right, which happens. Or you get a kid who is like, nah, 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 and then I say, see, then I ain't doing it for you, right? Uh, they say, you know, that's how that works, right? Uh, but this particular case, the girl says yes, and I'm like, come on up here. And she's like, oh, nah, nah, nah. I'm like, nah, nah, come on. If you want me to put on a song and dance for you, you come up here and you, and you see what that's like, right? Put on a song and dance for me. So she comes up to the stage, and she's a little shy. I give her the microphone. I'm like, you a rapper, right? She's like, no, nah, I got bars. I got, you know, I'm with it, you know? I'm like, all right. I'm like, well, here's your chance. And uh, she stood with the microphone, and you can see her shaking. And just as I'm about to take the microphone back, because I also don't want to traumatize this person, right? Uh, <laughs> she, she sort of says, you know, hey or yo or something. And she could hear her voice uh, reverberate around the room. And then in that moment, you could see her, like, begin to swell, right? 
just to hear her voice loudly and to hear it sort of bouncing off her friends, bouncing off the walls, the people in the back of the room, bouncing off her teachers, to hear her voice largely outside of her own body uh, was changing her in front of everybody. And in that moment, I realized this is it. Like, this is the thing. You know, maybe it's not um, that young people are, I mean, you all know all the things that adults often say about you, right? Maybe it's none of those things. Maybe it's that young people honestly just don't know yet what it feels like to know that their voices have power, right? That their voices can move and change a room, can shift the temperature and the climate of a country, and can literally knock the world off its axis. Maybe young people just don't know, and maybe that's because we're not doing, we as an adult, aren't doing a good enough job at letting them know and creating spaces for them to do so. We're not giving the microphone to you to say, go ahead, say your thing, sing your song, do your dance, talk your talk, tell your story, right? So that you know, I ain't gotta worry about everything that's happening externally. The thing internal is just as powerful, right? The last story I wanna tell you very quickly because I had to also check myself when it comes to this. I remember talking to Jackie years ago, Jacqueline, sorry, Jacqueline, <laughs> you, you know. Formal and informal, right? I remember talking to Jacqueline years ago. I think we were at an award ceremony or something, and I had gotten some award, and I had the utmost respect for her. She's one of my heroes. She's my OG, right? Just somebody that I look to for help and for guidance, uh, for the route, right? This is what I'm supposed to be doing step after step to get to wherever it is that she is, right? That is, you know, we all need a mentor in our lives, and I look at her as, as, as a friend, but also as a mentor, and so I go to her this one day, and she's congratulating me, and for some reason, I feel the need to tell her, I just want you to know, like, even though I got this award and I'm doing all right, I'm never going to be better than you. Right? Because that's what we do as a way to honor our people, right? It's like, yo, I just want you to know, I feel like I'm doing a good job, but I'm never going to be as great as you. And so your position on the, on the top of that mountain is safe. I'm never going to be able to pass you. And uh, I'll never forget her sort of squinching up her face and looking at me and said, you, I guess you think that's a compliment. Uh, and of course, my mom, I'm like, yeah, like I'm telling you, you know. And she's like, it's not a, it's not a compliment, man. Why do you think I've worked so hard for the last 30 years for you to not pass me? Right? Is that what you think? You know, your job is to do all I've done in half the time and to push it forward. And so I want to say as I, as I take a seat is that Jackie, uh, I, uh, I will do what I can to push the line, to take what you've done over the last 30 years, to take what you've done over the last two years, um, and, and, and to take that and use it as a seed to make it bigger, uh, to reach more young people, uh, and, to, and to truly honor the work you've done for us, the collective we, um, by doing the very best I can by us. You have my word, all right? I appreciate y'all. Thank you for this. Let's get to work. So now I get to interview a little mm. bit because we're gonna go back to that 19 or 17 and reading and what was it about books that it, you were 17, mm -hmm. and that was the first time you had read a book cover to cover. Right. You've been reading. Sort of. Yeah. Sort so of. what was it about that book, and what book was it? It was, um, first of all, did y'all see the picture of me when I was 22? Crazy, right? <laughs> Wild. You know, I, got, I got shaved, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, you know what? It was, it was Richard Wright's Black Boy. That was the book. And, and yeah. And, uh, and the, reason, the reason that book did so much for me, honestly, had nothing to do with the story itself. It had everything to do with, on the second page of the book, the main character uh, burns his mother's house down. On the second page. And I was like, word, this is what I'm talking about. Right? <laughs> right? Because, because really, and the young folks in the room, you know this, right? It isn't that it's, everybody thinks we hate to read. And what it is is that we just hate being bored. And reading can be mad boring sometimes. Right? Sometimes, like, that's, that's a truth that we don't ever want to talk about because it's, it's passe to say it, especially in a library. Um, <laughs> but the truth is, is that some reading, uh, if it's not the thing that's connecting to us, um, if it's not something that, 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 that sort of is sinking its teeth in us, if it's not something with some, some intensity or some stakes from the, from, the, from, the, from the outset, it can be a little dry. 
and sometimes uh, in in the past, uh, reading specialists and people in reading would say, well, you it's almost like eating uh, broccoli or Brussels sprouts. You've got to finish it. Yeah. And it's like, well, but I don't like it. But no, you gotta finish. You gotta finish. So finish. then you're like, I hate reading. Sure. And and, and using that same analogy, because I'm glad you brought this up, because Brussels sprouts, right? Like the worst vegetable ever in the 1980s. Sorry, so, I understand. And then, but then in like 2000, Brussels sprouts got delicious, right? All of a sudden. Well, they put. Got delicious, right? And they so, put stuff on of it. Of course, they put all this stuff on it. They deep fry them. And the thing is, is that it could be argued, right? It could be argued that oh, well, the new Brussels sprouts aren't quite as healthy. And my theory is, does it really matter if it changes how we feel about Brussels sprouts? Thank you. Right? That's what I think about. about I even you. ordered it one time. There you go. <laughs> what the heck? It had bacon. What <laughs> uh, OK. But it needed something it to needed grab something. you. And that's what like Richard Wright did on that second page. It gave you the incentive to say, I want to finish. That's it. And it kept you going. And once you finish, and everybody knows this, once you finish anything, all you want to do is feel the feeling of finishing something else. Right? So then I became sort of addicted to the idea of finishing a thing. Completion uh, becomes compulsory. And, and that was sort of what was happening. Now, did you keep reading and say, OK, uh, I want to complete, but I, I want to feel comfortable to put this one down and find another one? that got you going? Yeah, I think for me, I mean, after Richard Wright, I realized, hey, that, look, this is a book, these, these guys, Richard Wright was writing in the 20s and 30s, um, and then I started to read everything in the Harlem Renaissance, and everything, right, because what I realized also was I could connect, I, they don't sound like me, but they sound like my mother, <laughs> right? They sound like my family on, 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 and during the holidays at the table, right? The way my uncles are sounding, my grandparents, right? And so at least I could identify with something familiar, and so I sort of just covered, uh, I became sort of, um, really interested in just covering all the literature of the Harlem Renaissance and then all the literature of the black arts movement, which sounded even more like my mother, right? And just, and really working my way up in that way before sort of expanding out. Now, there are a lot of people, and I have it here to say, it's uh, a lot of book haters, mm. or hate reading, of boys. Yeah. What do you think that is? You know what I think it is? I, um, a few things. Number one, I think we live in a world, specifically a country, uh, that limits the idea of what a boy can be. Uh, and it's interesting because I know that we usually speak that way about young girls, and I think it's true there too, it, but a little different in that young boys aren't, oftentimes aren't allowed to be whole human. Young girls are never treated like whole humans, mm. but, they, but they get to actualize, but they get to actualize the feeling of being a human. Young boys are treated like whole humans, but can never actually live in the world as one, uh, right? Because they're not allowed to, quote unquote, uh, they can't cry or be afraid or be anxious and insecure. They can't, all these things that are, that are indicative of our humanity, boys are taught very young, you're not allowed to do these things. And so for instance, you go into any prison in America, specifically a prison that's, that's uh, actually any juvenile detention center, and you walk into any library and you ask the librarian at that prison, what are the most checked out books? They're either gonna say sort of urban fiction, things of these, this nature, uh -huh. or they're gonna say romance novels. And most people don't know this. Most people don't know. Everyone's like, well, why would a kid in jail be reading romance novels? The, the, the question uh, is, is an easy answer. They're, if they're 14 years old and you're locked in a box, right? You're not having your dating experiences. And so you read the romance novels as a way to sort of put yourself in a space that you're, where you might be if you weren't in prison. But the, but the real question is, why can't these boys feel comfortable reading these books if they weren't in prison? Because they, they like them. They're enjoying them. But a romance novel is never going to be given to a boy if he asks for what he's looking for in a library. It won't even be on his suggestion list, and he probably won't even have a heart to read it. And if he does, he'll have to read it privately, which is fine. Right, Think, thinking about all of these things, and so I, 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 it's not that boys hate books, it's that I don't know if we're doing the same, I don't, we're not doing the necessary kind of work or asking the right questions to young men. And furthermore, I think that the, we haven't been making the right work, right? Because, because you also have to have a breadth of work that can attract and appeal to all the young people uh, specific, and, and also young men. And I think for me, it's like, look, if you like ESPN, if you like sports, then re read ESPN. If you like Fortnite, then let's write a book about Fortnite. I don't care what it is, right? Let's just figure out how to attach it to you and whatever your interests are, um, because I, instead of me spending all my time judging you, I'd rather spend my time trying to figure out how to fix the issue. 
Now you talked about telling your story and what you, the transformation you saw in that young lady, and that's what your program is going to be: grab the mic and yeah. tell your story. Yeah, I think I think that young people, unfortunately, um, I think they they have so much to say. I've learned so much from from young folks around this country and all over the world. Uh, but I think that, that as an adult, I have to exercise a certain kind of humility around you in order for me to be able to get that story out of you. Nobody wants, you know, I, I talk to kids all the time. They're like, yo, my teacher keep asking me, you know, what's wrong and to talk to her. But when I'm going to talk to somebody, why, why would I talk to her when she ain't never told us who she is? I don't know anything about her, but she want me to tell her everything about me. Right? And as an adult, we all know that that's the way intimacy works. You got to give a little in order to get some. Right? You can't expect me to expose all the things about my life to you, even though you're trying to help me, but I don't even know where you are from. I don't even know your first name. I don't know how you grew up. Why would I just assume that you're going to be able to hold my secrets? Why would I assume that you're going to be able to protect my insecurities? Right? And so my goal is to say, listen, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the, national, the newly national ambassador of young people's uh, literature, but I'm not the ambassador for young people. That's you. You are the ambassador for yourselves. My job is to create a space as an advocate to make sure that you can champion yourself in a way that actually works. That's all. Right? I want to put the power back in your hands and say, look, I got my stories. Most of you read them. If you go to my school, if, if, you, if I come to your school at the end of my talk, I say the same thing every single day. I want you to love my stories, but not nearly as much as I want you to love your own. Right? Love your stories. There's freedom there. There's power there. You can, I'm not an exceptional person. It's, there's nothing special about me. I just knew early on in life that my story mattered. And once I was able to grab a hold of it and put it on the page, it made a life for myself. Just telling my own truth. And so if I get an opportunity to put the mic in their hands and they get to tell the rest of this world who they really are, not who everybody says they are, all they care about is Instagram and Snapchat filters, all they care about is Fortnite and video games, all they want to do is listen to this and listen to that. By the way, none of this is wrong, right? Because if you're 15, you're 15. So what we judge you for is really just you being 15 and us saying 15 shouldn't be 15 anymore because we've forgotten what 15 feels like, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? My, my job is to let you say, is to give you the microphone and say, yo, I'm 15. And these are the things that I care about. This is what I'm concerned about in our world. These are the things I'm not, I don't worry about. Here are the things I hear y'all saying about me, and, he, and here is how I feel about that. This is my name, my city, my town. This is my family and my story. And you're going to go to rural, small towns across America. Now, why do you see a special need there? What I see, um, I see that there are young people there who can't come to the Library of Congress, right? I see that, right? I see, I see that there are, I've been in, in, in one-stop light towns where the closest hospital is an hour and a half away, right? I've seen uh, places like West Palm Beach where you got the wealthiest people in the world who live there and 10 miles down the street, there's no grocery stores, let alone a library or a bookstore, there's no rec centers no jobs, no car, like places where there are unpaved roads. I've been all through Nebraska and all through Minnesota, I've been all these places and what I realize is that we have it good, even the worst of us, right? If you live in Washington, D.C. and the surrounding areas, you're doing all right, because you can get here on a train, here, to the country's library, to the greatest museum system on earth for free, right? There are resources here. Yes, there's marginalization. Yes, it's complicated. Yes, there are complex lives and different resources and all the same issues that exist in every major city exist right here in our own. But if you ain't never been through the rural south, if you haven't gone through Appalachia, we're talking about a very different thing. And I can't pretend, I say this all the time, I can't, I can't keep saying I love young people if I only really mean I love a few of them. If I only love the ones who got, who got you know, street smarts because they grew up in the city, or the ones who can afford cool sneakers, or the ones who you know, got interest in uh, uh, accents, or the ones who understand how to use chopsticks because they grew up in New York, right? the ones who've been around every kind of person so they are diverse and open-minded. I can't. They, yes, I love them too, but I also have to love all of our kids, and not all of our kids are having these opportunities and, having, and living this experience. So I want to go. And I want to, and I want to, I want to see them uh, be proud of where they're from. I was in Mexico one time years back, and I was 19. 
And I was in a small town, a, a, a barrio called uh, Saltillo. And this is all dirt road, and everybody lived in, in scrap iron shanty homes. And, and a young girl came to me and tugged me on the shoulder, I mean, on, on my pant leg, and said, I want to show you my house. And I said, okay, and she was so happy. And we walked uh, down this dirt road and around the corner, and when we get to her house, there's no door or roof. But she's so proud. But she's so proud to show me, this is my home. This is my story. I am not ashamed of it, nor am I embarrassed. I'm proud of who I am and what I have and where I'm from. Imagine if we could do that. Take, the, take, take a sample set of the oral history of America from the mouths of babes. Right. I'd like to see all of us refute that. Then I'd like to see the statistics and the news and all of the propaganda machines refute that. Let's hear it from the kids and you tell me it's wrong. Right. Let's see. Let's hold everybody's feet to the fire by putting the power back in their hands. Wow. So, back when you were nine, and thinking of uh, giving somebody a mic at nine, what kind of rap were you doing? Uh, I wasn't. I wasn't rapping. I was what rapping you along doing? with. But you were doing poetry. I was doing. I started writing poetry around around nine. Um, I mean, my story is that you know, there's rap music. I loved Queen Latifah when I was a kid. I loved. What I, I mean, I grew up, I was lucky that I grew up at a time when we had all the different sounds and all the different versions of rap music. And we had, so you could listen to Wu-Tang and you could listen to MC Light and you could listen to Queen Latifah, Tupac, Tribe Called Quest, all these different kinds of groups and different kinds of people. And I was obsessed about the way they were bending and, 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 and challenging the, the, uh, the construction of language, right? Challenging it, saying, let's push it to the max and bend the language a bit to make it work for us our way. Um, I started writing poetry shortly after this uh, because my grandmother passed away. And, you know, I'm, I'm a, I love my mother. My mom is sort of crying and dealing and coping with that. And anybody in here who's ever heard your mother cry, you know it's a strange experience, right? That first time, it's something that happens to you on the inside, and it's hard to explain it. But if you've ever, it, some of you know what I'm talking about, right? That, it's a weird thing that happens. And uh, I wrote down a, a couple lines because I had been studying rap lyrics and reading rap lyrics because we had liner notes back in the day. And for the young folk, your teachers will tell you it's fine. Uh, <laughs> Me. And, uh, and uh, I'm studying the rap lyrics, and so I write a couple of lines down, and, and this thing was sort of used at the funeral. Um, and so I, got, so I got to be a nine or 10 year old with a taste of watching words become power, because my family members were like, hey, that thing you wrote, right, it meant something to me, right? That thing you wrote, it made me feel better. My grandmother had a whole bunch of siblings, and over the course of two years, that generation began to die out. And so everybody would call me, hey, can you write another one of those things for, you know, that thing you're doing, can you do some more of that for, you know. And I'm 10, 11, 12 years old, and so the first, you know, 10 poems are about death, are about helping wow. people try to figure out how to understand something that I don't even quite understand at 10, 12 years old. Um, but this is what was coming out of me, and, and that's sort of how, how it all began. And you do see, a, or do you see a relationship between rap lyrics and poetry and uh, Of course, and anybody who says otherwise, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know how much we can we can elaborate Congress, like Jackie said, I don't want to say too much, but I will say, but I, but I will, even though we're technically in the bastion of anti-censorship, uh, uh, I think that anyone who believes that rap music is not poetry um, doesn't know much about poetry and has a very limited scope on what poetry is. You know, that's like saying that Shakespeare um, is all play and no poetry, right? That's like saying that, uh, what, I mean- Nikki Giovanni. Exactly, exactly. So is, 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 is poetry and hip hop uh, the same? Are they, are they a part of the same family? Of course. I mean, it came out of poetry. You do your research, go back to the 60s and 70s, and you listen to Gil Scott Heron, The Last Poets, uh, I mean, these brothers, I mean, Linton Quasey Johnson over in Brixton, England, doing the same thing, coming out of Jamaica, the Jamaican ska music and reggae music, doing very similar things, the toasting. This is all, and you go even further back than that, and you listen to all of the, you know, the old folk tales and how they were spoken audibly, uh, and, and they rhymed, and they had jokes and punchlines and storylines. I mean, this is the thing that we've been doing. It comes out of our bones, uh, especially as somebody who, who is of the black tradition and of black culture, this is something that is inherent. The dozens. Uh, it, it, the dozens, exactly. I mean, you go all the way back to, to the West African griot. What I was doing at 10 years old, the griots do for, that's a part of their job, right? The oral storytelling usually performed at death ceremonies. 
That's what I was doing as a child. Not because I knew, but because I believe in genetic memory. I believe that we, we are who we are, and we've been who we've been. Right? So what inspires you today? What, 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 what do you me? feed on to get your inspiration? Uh, I'm around young folks all the time. And whenever I talk to people and they're like, man, I just can't stand kids. I'm like, you're not spending enough time around them. Right? And if you are, you're only spending time around them in a particular capacity. You know, my mother told me a long time ago when I started dating, my mother was like, listen, Jason, I want to make sure you understand that you know, if you go on a date to dinner and a movie, you only know her at the dinner and at movies. But you don't know how she's going to act when your car break down on the side of the road. Right? <laughs> right? And, so, and so I think that we, we know young people in very specific capacities. I mean, and that's, a, that's free game for you, just so you know. Like, y'all can take... That's real. You know. Thank you, Miss Reynolds. <laughs> Thank you very much. My mother's full of that. She got a lot of them gems, you know. What I mean? But but I. It's true. But I but but I think young people, it's the exact same thing. We know them in very particular capacity, in a very particular capacity, and in an interesting context. Usually at school, and so we're like, I don't like young people. Well, you only know them in places where they're forced to do things they don't want to do, right? So so if you know them outside of school, and if you get to know them in your neighborhoods and in your in your, in your local bookstores and and community centers and wherever else they hang out, you get to know who they really are. And, and if you catch one of them alone, you really get to know yeah. who they are when they don't got to put on a show for their friends. You really get to know who they are, and I think um, I've done that an awful lot over the years, and uh, they keep inspiring me. Every time I turn the TV on and I see them protesting, I'm inspired. Every time I walk into a school and I see them protesting in schools, I'm inspired. Every time I turn on YouTube and I see whatever the new dance is, I'm inspired by that creativity, by that kind of irreverence. Right? Then, every time I hear a new, a new word, whatever the newest word is, as, as language continues to change, that inspires me. Do your thing. Create new codes for yourselves. That's an amazing thing. Our, our parents had you know, shorthand. They don't talk about this, but they had shorthand. So what you do during text messaging, that ain't new either. They did that. Malleable language, right? We've been doing it. Yeah, they would change the words and put a word in front, a letter in front and exactly. do that. And I forgot what that Yeah, it's, see, it's an interesting code. thing. It was coded language. And I think you all uh, are, the, are the bearers of the new code. And I am so grateful to stand alongside you and do my best to decipher it, just so that I could give it to the rest of the world and let them know that y'all are geniuses. Yay. Now. I think we have an opportunity for you to ask some questions, too. And I know that's going to happen. Oh, man. J Jason, I just want to say thank you for speaking for all of us and for doing it so vibrantly. Uh, from my heart to your heart, thank you. Um, just tremendous. Now. We're going to have questions and answers, so um, think about your questions. And while you do, um, a little bird named Leanne told me that there is a teacher in Bishop McNamara School who used to teach Jason. And his name is Chris Williams. And Chris Williams, will you please stand yeah, up? Please stand up. Please. Yes. Where? Oh. Best teacher ever. And now, surprise upon surprise, there are also th a couple or three former classmates of Jason's. Will uh -oh. you please stand up? This is like, this is your Ooh. life. Oh, classmates. This is like, this is your life, that old child. I know. Oh, your teacher, you said that was your best teacher ever. The greatest teacher I ever had in any part of my education. And any. Jason, the young people of Bishop McNamara have a gift for you. They put together something especially for you. And now I'm going to ask the representative of the class to come and bring it up. Oh, good. Oh, this is. Oh, it's a book bag, yes. I finally got a book bag. Oh, neat. I appreciate y'all. You want to tell us a little bit about what's yeah, in the what's, bag, what's in you the guys? Bag? Let, me, let me open it up. There better not be no books. 
<laughs> well. All right, let's see. Oh, some swag. It's some, it's, so there's some private letters, and I'm not rather than this. What's this? You know what? I, I'm going to come over there and get a varsity jacket. I got one of these. What are oh. these called? These look. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Drawstring bag and a sweatshirt, t shirt, a whole bunch swag. of swag is in there. Yes. Hey, Mustangs, I appreciate y'all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, that's great. That's so great. Thank you so much. Um, and now, let's start with the Q&A. Uh, I've got some questions over here somewhere, perhaps. Um, right here. Would you please say your name first and your school? Okay. My name is Chinira, and I go to Bishop McNamara High School. And so at my school, I run the poetry club. I'm the president of the poetry club there. And not only me, but a lot of the members in the poetry club are incredible writers, like best I've ever heard. And so I just like, I want to know if there's any way that, you know, I can get their voices out there so they, that they know how powerful their voices are. Because I know it when I go outside, I'm just like, you guys have to hear the people in my poetry club because they're incredible. But nobody else knows because they're just the people that sit in the lunchroom alone or like they just go home after school. Like people just don't know the power that they have. Yeah, I think, first of all, shout out to the Poetry Club. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I didn't, we didn't have a Poetry Club when I was there. Uh, uh, did we? Uh, why wasn't I a part of it? <laughs> Tierra knew about it, I didn't know about it. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. Anyway, uh, what I will say is, um, so first of all, uh, you all are living in a time when everything is possible, right? You all have the capacity to make everything known. I always think it's so interesting because y'all y'all know how to promote everything until it's time to really promote the thing that y'all need to promote, right? Y'all got Instagram and YouTube and all these things that you can use to to promote the things that you make. I mean. When I was a kid, none of those things existed. So we had to go down U Street, and you had to go into, back then you could go into all these different open mics that were happening every single night of the week. And I was a 16-year-old and would go in there and sit in the back until it was my turn and get up and do my thing, you know? That still exists, though. You, you, there's Spit That, which is still in the, Tony, anything else, bro? There's, what, what exists out here? So there's Spit That, and then, are there any other spots? Busboys and Poets, yeah, yeah, yeah. Busboys and Poets. Split this rock. Oh, split this rock. We work with them. Split this rock. Yeah, he know all that. Hi, everybody. Oh, matter of fact, sister right there, that's Alexa. She works for Split This Rock. There you go, she split actually this manages rock. the youth poetry programs. Yeah. So Boom. she probably would know a little bit better than yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to. So that's how. It, DCU slam team, any slam teams in the school, poetry slam team? There's a bunch of that. Yeah, so like, so like we're going to make sure, when, before this is over, we're going to link you up and make sure that y'all talk, because she could probably help you out as well. But also, look up this uh, YouTube um, this YouTube show. It's called, and Jackie, you know, I'm going to talk to you about this. It's called Hours Poetica. And you know, this is John Green joining it. He didn't start it? Oh, poetry. So look it up. It's called Hours Poetica. Right, O U R S, Hours Poetica, and um, start something like that. When you look at it and you see what it is, it's fire. And if you got a poetry club, y'all can start something like that, and you can start to proliferate these things. And then just tweet me, and I'll tweet, I'll tweet it to everybody. Else. All right. I know that's what you're waiting for. You're like, can you just give me like a? I got you. <laughs> Over here, my name is Justin Jones. Uh, what was your favorite book that you ever made? What was my favorite book that I ever made? Justin, I, you know, it's tricky, right? Because it's like asking your mama who her favorite child is. You know what I mean? I think for me, um, for me, the two, there are two books that I love more than in any of the other ones. It is Boy in the Black Suit, uh, because it's all about sort of a young man dealing with his grief and his emotions. And then there's a book called As Brave As You. Those books are the ones that I, that I personally like really, really love. Uh, and then after that, I like Ghost and I love Long Way Down. And you know, I love those books too. They're not my favorites, right? But they are, um, but I'm probably most proud of them, obviously. Like I love Ghost and, and that whole series. Um, and the newest book, and the newest book might be the best thing I've ever written to me, to me, I look both ways. So that doesn't answer your question, but you know. Thanks for that question. <laughs> um, next question.
Um, my name is Cassine Tate from Store Hobson Middle School. And um, uh, do you have any, um, like, what's your favorite thing that you would like to do with your mom? Like, think yeah. hanging out with her? And you know what? So, like, my mom and I, so here's the thing. My mom and I spend a lot of time together when I'm not all over the place. And, you know, we live, we like to do really simple things, you know. My mom, one of these people who live in Costco, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so, you know, he's he like, I know, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, even if it's so, so, like, as you get older, these things get much more simple, what, yes. what matters. And so if my mom's like, I'm going to Costco, can you want to come? Then my answer has to be yes, right? Like, and then really, I don't be wanting to go, right? But, but, I, but I do want to be around her, right? And so we just go to Costco sometimes or... You know, we'll, we'll, you know, we have all these little, very small things that we like to do, you know, to sit in our house and watch Family Feud, right? Like really simple things that matter to me and that matter to her and that's kind of our thing. Now, my pie in the sky though, what I would love to do, and she knows this, um, is that I would love to take her on a trip out of the country. Um, and I've been begging for it. And I'm putting her on the spot because I want everybody to pressure her. <laughs> um, I've been begging her to do it, but she won't do it. And so, uh, you know, eventually, hopefully, one of these days, she'll let me take her to go and see something abroad, you know. But if not, we, we're good either way, you know. You're good at Costco. Yeah, we're good at Costco. <laughs> Tasting everything. Thanks for that question. <laughs> That's uh, the in the white sweater, please. Oh, um, what is the process of publishing a book like? Hmm. What's it like? Yeah, like... Or what is it or what's it like? Because... Oh, uh, two things. I don't... <laughs> it's tricky, right? Are you asking what the process is or are you asking what the process is like? Because if you ask what it's like, I'm going to tell you how I feel about it. Uh, yeah, I get that. Um, I suppose I'm asking more what it's like. Okay. Hard. Uh, um, it's, it's an interesting process, man. It's not like anything else I've ever done because you spend so much time writing this thing, right? I'm pouring hour after hour, day after day, week, month, sometimes year after year, working on whatever it is that I'm working on. And then you turn it into someone who did not write it, right? But has, you know, sharp eyes and all this technical ability and all this experience. And they tell you after all this time you've spent that this is not very good, right? <laughs> and so, and, so, and my editor's here and she's like, oh God, you know? That this is not very good. And then you have to spend another year, right? Rewriting this thing that you wrote, right? Rewriting it over and over and over again. And, and the way I, you know, and eventually after all of this, then, you know, you get to the, the, the book in the store thing, but that takes about two years. Um, but it's okay. The pro you know, I like to think about it like, um, you know, if you make, if you make uh, the editor's job and the editorial process and, and the publishing process is just adding season to the thing that I already made, right? And so it's like, it, think about, I always say, it's like cooking a chicken breast. You put a chicken breast on the stove and you cook it up and you bite into it. Even if it's done, it don't taste like nothing unless you put some season on it, right? Put a little sauce on it, right? So the editorial process, this is basically how we, this is when you put the sauce on it, right? And it doesn't always feel good because I got to make the sauce, right? Uh, but, but it always tastes much, much, much better. It's not good enough to just be done. Got to taste good, right? And that's sort of what it feels like. That's one wow. of the best. Some truths being spoken here. Uh, another question over here. Thank you. I'm Margo and I go to St. Patrick's. What inspires you the most when you're writing? Like, where do you go for ideas? Oh, where do I go for ideas? So this is good. This is an interesting question. I, um, I don't really go, I mean, I, I try to live a, a curious life. Now, I tell young people all the time, uh, hold on to your imagination more than anything else, other than your integrity. Hold on to your imagination because uh, the world, and, and unfortunately, even sometimes school, uh, will do everything it can to, um, to take it from you. Right, so hold on as tight as possible to your imagination. And if you can hold on to your imagination, you, you, you know then that like imagination uh, fuels curiosity and curiosity is what fuels creativity. Right, so first, it's, I live an imaginative life. I live a life where I'm curious about the world around me. I know I don't know anything and that's the greatest position to be in. Right, the greatest position. Sometimes I turn on the TV and I'm just flipping, flipping and I'm like, all right, let's see what's happening on the Discovery Channel. 
just because I'm, it's probably important that I learn about this strange African frog I've never heard about. <laughs> it, doesn't, you know, it doesn't seem important right now, but I'm gonna need to know what slime does on these frog backs, right? Like, a, you know, I mean, my teacher in high school, one of my teachers, Mr. Williams, we had to watch uh, Baraka. If any of you read um, the track series, there's a part in Sunny where he's watching this, this movie called Baraka, right? It's a silent film about, and it's just all the world moving at the same time. And I had to watch that when I was in Mr. Williams' class. And at the time, it's like, what is this, right? <laughs> and then now at 36 years old, I'm like, this movie was a masterpiece, right? And it, and it, and it, and it, and it, it opened up an imaginative chamber that I could tap back into 20 years later. You never know when it's gonna come, but your job is to store up all these little creative tidbits. The world around you is beautiful. Right? That's the only thing about your generation that I do challenge a little bit, like pick your head up. Like sometimes you gotta pull your face away from the screen. Just because you gotta look around and see how beautiful the world you, that you live in truly is. Right? The rabbit hole is just that, and I get it. I'm a part of it too. It bothers me, I'm always like scrolling, scrolling, right? But it would, it would serve all of us a moment, adults in the room too, to pick your heads up and look around and really look at what's happening, the good and the bad. And if you're not inspired by that, then I don't know what the point is. Right? Look harder. If you're not inspired, look harder. And if you're still not inspired, talk to somebody. Ask questions. Get to know people who are not like you. Go to neighborhoods that are not like yours. Be non, try to be non-judgmental. Try to exert a sense of empathy. Right? Stretch out, complicate your own arguments. Whatever you think you know, complicate it. Until you don't know it, then make yourself know it again. Right? And you'll learn new things, and new things will be added to that, to that well of information that you could pull from. So that's how I sort of, I live an inspired life, so I ain't gotta wait to be inspired. You know? Wonderful answer. One more question, we only have time for one more. Over here, please. Uh, my name is Jaycee, I come from Ida B. Wells. Uh, we read, we read uh, the book, Hummingbirds in the Trenches by Kamwani Fidel, yeah. and we've also read some books from Tupac, as well as from you, and we're currently writing our own book. And well, what I want to ask is, would you like to come to our book launch February 27th at Pike? <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, hey, listen. <laughs> you gotta shoot your shot, right? <laughs> uh, what's the date? What's the date? Uh, February t 27th at five to six. At Ida B. Wells. Yep. Uh, February. Okay, okay. My, my folks in here somewhere. February 27th. February 27th, five to six. I will do my best. Thank I you. I will do my best. All right. Okay. <laughs> So I want to say thank you, muchas gracias, to Jason for a fabulous performance. I want you all to stay in your seats for a while, but please give a hand to these wonderful, wonderful Jason and the Librarian of Congress.